I wanted to use this to, to help promote the show, but I don't have a green screen behind me right now. So I was going to use this. Does that look weird? That looks blue. What else is in it? She's, oh, no, I see it. Clear and vivid. No, that looks good. That looks okay. good. Yeah, that's perfect. I was getting, uh, without the green screen on Zoom, you get weird artifacts. Like you yes. disappear. Once in a while, you disappear. Yeah, sometimes you look like a big soap sud. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. That's right. No. <laughs> yeah. Okay, well, are you all set to start? I'm all set. I'll, I'll look at you in, here. Okay, excellent. Okay, my latest guest is the actor, director, screenwriter, comedian, and author, Alan Alder. He's won multiple Emmy and Golden Globe Awards. He's nominated for an Academy Award. He played Hawkeye Pierce on MASH and had uh, recurring roles on television programs such as The West Wing and 30 Rock. He's appeared in loads of films and he has a brilliant podcast called Clear and Vivid. Alan Alder, welcome to the Pod 20 and the Zoomcast. Thank you, except for the fact that brilliant is way overused. <laughs> I really take that as a high compliment. There you go. Well, you should. Now, we, I mean, we you have... Say, you say, I'm going to call a taxi, and the other person says, brilliant. That's, <laughs> that's what we say all the time. Yeah. Which is very strange for the Brits, because the Brits are normally... Because I lived in New Zealand and Australia for a long time, and, and the Brits are, are... Like in New Zealand, if you say, how are you? Someone in New Zealand will say, excellent. But in, in Britain, they'll say, not so bad. So, so, but brilliant is reserved for the things that really count. Like, I think I have bands. <laughs> yeah. Or, or I'm talking to Alan Alda. Oh, so well, that's... that's different. No, that's different. <laughs> <laughs> so we have to start with MASH. Uh, okay. First of all, how do you feel about MASH all these years on? When it, when, I mean, it's on TV constantly somewhere. You travel around the world. You, you, you go to a hotel room and MASH is on. What emotion does it stir up for you? Well, I don't see it much. I hear it's really good, but I haven't seen it in a while. But I'll tell you the thing that does strike me, uh, and, and it seems it's a great compliment, but it seems so odd that people who weren't born when we went off the air have discovered it, including 10-year-olds, 11-year-olds, even younger. And, and, and that, that's a, it's a very nice feeling because what, that means what we did has a lasting value. It didn't just appeal to the people at that short period in history. Yeah. So I'm, I'm very, I'm very uh, proud of it. I, I'm very happy. I, it changed my life and it changed the lives of all of us who did it. So of course we're, we look back on it with great fondness and we all were, became friends. It was a big deal for me. As I say, I lived in New Zealand. Um, I was 19 in 1983, and the show was, was huge there. And so what they did was when it finished, they decided to just start again at the beginning, and they showed every episode from the start at 6 o'clock every night, just before the 6.30 news. And I lived with my parents, and if one of my friends would ring between 6 and 6.30, I'd say, tell them, my mother would answer the phone, I'd say, tell them to call back when MASH is finished and everybody knew. Did you have any idea when you were making it, the impact that it would have, like especially no. at the very beginning? No, well, at the very beginning, it wasn't doing very well in the ratings. Out of 78 shows, we were like number 76, not number one. And they were always talking about the top 10. So I used to tell people, we're in the top 78. <laughs> yeah. But you were definitely the top one by the time the, the, the final episode. Uh, uh, sh uh, show. Probably, yeah. That was the most watched show uh, of that kind uh, ever to happen. So that was, that's, that was a tremendous surprise. The night it was played, I mean, we knew, we knew we were doing good work and that people appreciated it. But the night it was played on television, we watched it at the studio on a big screen. And then we drove to a restaurant and I said to Loretta Swit, Loretta, look, there are no cars on the street. This is ordinarily a busy hour. Half the country was home watching the show at the same time. So it was, it was an extraordinary experience. None of us, none of us expected that. And 
I loved the way that the show changed over time when, well, obviously when you started writing and, and directing some of the episodes and it became more dramatic and it, it had no, more I don't of a think so. I, 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 I don't think, I think it's a sort of an internet myth that I got more control of the show. I, I did write a lot. I directed a lot. But the producers were always in charge. So really? Major changes were all they're doing. And, and uh, I, I, you know, I would express an opinion, but it wasn't always accepted. So it's not, you know, any, any changes people see in the show, good or bad, are really not, not due to me, except whatever quality of each individual episode I wrote had, which, I'm, which I, I, once in a while, I can remember what I wrote. And I'm, I'm very pleased with it in most cases. How about censorship back then? Because it started in 72. Did that change as the series went along? Could you get away yes. with a lot more? Yes. It turns out that forbidden words are not so forbidden if you're really popular. <laughs> <laughs> Which is counterintuitive. You think you'd be able to get a, away with more when, when hardly anybody's watching, when, it, wouldn't you? When nobody's listening, right? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so in one of the first few shows, Radar had a line in which he said, uh, I, I don't know about that, sir. I'm a virgin at that. With no sexual meaning. It just meant he was unfamiliar with the subject. The sentence said, you can't say the word virgin. So Larry Gelbart, the head writer, was really upset at that. So he wrote a line in the next show that he knew they couldn't take out. I say to a kid on a stretcher, where are you from, son? He says, the Virgin Islands, sir. <laughs> Did but they were still, go ahead, sorry. Did it become a bit of a game then to see what you could get in? It was a, a morbid game because sometimes you needed the, the juice, the sauce of a word that really has no, no repugnance to it. It's common talk, but they, they were fastidious. I mean, so fastidious that in one show, this, it's a show that I wrote. There was a jock strap on a table. Do you use that word over there, jock Yeah, strap? We, we know what that is, yeah. Okay. So Loretta comes into the, Margaret comes into the tent and sees it and says, how dare you parade that thing before me? Well, the centuries were more fastidious than she was. They said, not only can you not have a jock strap, you can't even have a white piece of cloth representing a jockstrap on it. Now, now this, this to, to show the sexism at the same time of the rampant uh, censorship, in many shows I had walked through clotheslines or the equivalent shot of this, walking through clotheslines filled with women's brassiers and panties. <laughs> but a man's intimate apparel is somehow sacred and you can't show that, that's, that's the forbidden. So the whole thing was silly. The funniest story I heard about censorship on MASH, and maybe you can confirm whether it's true or not. I'll tell you where I heard it. You know Ken Levine, one of the writers on yeah, MASH? He has sure. a great podcast called Hollywood and Levine. And he told this story about <laughs> apparently there was a, a visiting general or something, and the colonel said, uh, take this man to the VIP tent. And the line was supposed to be, Radar was supposed to say, right this way, your vip penis." <laughs> and, that, and they that got was, it. I, <laughs> yeah. I didn't know about that. Which I think should be fine because, first of all, penis isn't a swear word. And secondly, if kids are so young they don't know what it means, they're not even going to hear it. They'll write this way, your VIP penis. So it just shows how touchy they, they could have they, been. You... If, if he had said, write this way, your, your vagina, that would have been allowed. <laughs> Based on the, <laughs> on, on the, the <laughs> precedent set over the jock strap and the knickers. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Um, it's funny, though, when TVNZ started showing them from the very beginning, I think it was the first five or six episodes, there was an extra doctor in the swamp. And his name has a racial connotation. Oh, that was one of the first couple of episodes. Yeah. 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 Oh, it seems that they could get it. They could get away with that. I mean, I'll say what it was, and it, it might be offensive to some people, but he was called Spear Chucker Jones, and he was a, he was a black character. But that seemed yeah, okay. And, and yeah, that other was, things. That yeah. was taken, as all the names were, from the uh, the book. 
the yeah. original book and also the original movie. Yeah. Uh, and it is offensive and and it, and it it disappeared partly because they put so many characters in the pilot in a way I guess to see which ones were promising for f uh, further stories. And then they realized they had to prune and get it down to a manageable number and a number of the characters were dropped including that one. Yeah. Now you've spent your whole life in show business. What's your earliest showbiz memory? Standing in the wings when I was two and a half years old watching my father in burlesque. He was a singer and a straight man when I was born. He became a very year. successful actor on screen and very, on stage was, as well. Robert known, Alda, yeah. Yeah, Robert Alda. He was known around the world. Um, so my earliest memories are watching chorus girls and comics and strippers. And when I, when I was two years old, I was, I was really upset later on in life to find out women walked around with their clothes on. <laughs> <laughs> now, in your book, Never Have Your Dog Stuffed, you mentioned your father had a thing. I think you described it as the banana walk. Could you just explain what that was? <laughs> it's funny you recall that. He, I, I, when, when he would come out on stage to the microphone center stage in vaudeville or if he was making an appearance someplace, he would walk from the wings and sort of move upstage so that the last five or six steps were straight down toward the audience. So he'd, he'd, he'd walk towards the back and then move. Yeah. yeah, so he made a kind of a banana on the stage so that his entrance was coming at them full frontally and his hand on his uh, abdomen, as if to say, sort of like a head waiter. <laughs> but it was a grand entrance. I'm just walking out to the microphone, but he made a banana. So in, in his honor to remember him, at his funeral, I, I did the banana walk and showed people how he did it. <laughs> Brilliant. Brilliant. I, like, I like memorials in, um, in show business. Show business memorials are the funniest funerals you can go to because they, they often impersonate the person who's dead and bring him back for a few more minutes. And uh, what else is a funeral for but to hang on to the person for maybe another day? You teach acting techniques to scientists to help them better connect with their audiences. What are the big mistakes that scientists make when they're trying to connect with audiences? They make the same mistakes we all make when we know something so deeply that we forget what it's like to be a beginner at it. And most of us have not spent our lives learning the science that a science, scientist has. So it's new to us. We're virgins at it. And the scientist has to take that into account and think, try to imagine what we're thinking as, as he or she speaks to us or writes for us. What's going on in our head? It's a, really an act of empathy. So it's not that scientists have a special need for it, but as far as communicating science is concerned, there is a very special need because we're We've entered a time, at least in our country, where science is tending to be regarded as just another opinion. And the, uh, the world of evidence and observation and analysis is disappearing and scientists have to make science clear and vivid to all of us so that we can, so that we can help fund the things that are promising keep funding the things that are necessary and help avoid things like the plague we're going through right now as we speak with the coronavirus. I think if science were, science were more universally acknowledged as the important thing it is, and if people were more tuned in to the scientific process, we would have, we would have done better things sooner, I think. Mm -hmm. And it might not be so bad. And I, I, it's not just my opinion. I'm drawing on the opinion of scientists to, uh, saying the same things. Yeah, that uh, that belief thing is is a really weird thing, isn't it? You basically, you just accept something without evidence. And uh, yeah, and it's yeah. it's 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 a reasonable approach. 
it's not it's not crazy to trust people to follow the advice of people you trust we, that's why we go to our parents when we're young if we're smart enough to and rely on their experience but we've lost a certain amount of trust in science for some reason partly because it's inconvenient for some people to follow science and to a great extent a scientist has to reestablish that trust in the listener when they're communicating about science so part of that is not acting like the the guru on the hill who knows everything you have to speak the language of the person you're talking to and you have to think about what they're going through as you talk to them what process is happening in their brain and you have to anticipate the resistance points because we all have, we all have resistance points we, we're all we're all familiar with the process of listening to commercials on television and we resist commercials so if it sounds like somebody's selling us a bill of goods we don't trust them don't you think absolutely yeah yeah so and and that's why the podcast is called clear and vivid as well that's right that's right and i love it i talk to so many interesting people i have you know we've done over a hundred shows so far my favorite and, and i was scared to listen to it it popped up on my phone and it said alan alda and tom hanks and i thought oh. I was almost scared to listen to it in why, case it why, wasn't why, as why good as, as I, th I mean, you know, two of my favorite people ever uh, together. <laughs> and I was almost scared in case it didn't live up to how I imagined how great it would be. And it really was terrific. You know, when you got onto well, the typewriters and, oh, yeah, just he's a great it. guy. He's a wonderful guy. As, as was Paul McCartney. Yeah, heard that one too. That was the week that, before, I think, or the week after. Very close yeah, together, yeah. though. Yeah. Yeah. And, and you know, we talk about communication in general on the show, communication and relating to other people, and not necessarily with regard to science, but sometimes I talk to Nobel Prize winners, and I do my best to have a conversation that's in plain talk. But everybody has a way of communicating, and I'm so curious to know the how the good communicators do it like like paul mccartney how does he write a song he writes a song maybe in a few minutes or a few days and the rest of the world is humming it for 50 years how does that happen <laughs> yeah and he was so kind and generous he he went over to to a piano that happened to be in the studio and he started writing a song right in front of me it was yeah. great but, yeah. but we have I have wonderful conversations with so many people. I, uh, I I wonder if you could help me out with a with a, a tip on acting because I've just started doing something. Oh what? I, I, I've just started narrating audio books. I've, oh, I've, that, I've done two. Good at it. I've done two so far, and I've, I'm working on another three at the moment. And. I know that in your book, when you were looking, you, you said that when you were looking to get inside the character, often you look down at the shoes. That helped you. <laughs> yes, as long, as long as you're wearing shoes that the character would have worn. Yeah, but with an audio book, I got nothing. I just got the words on the page, and I might get a little bit about them. If they've got some kind of regional accent, like it's a Glaswegian, there's, there's one, it was, it was soldiers in India, British soldiers in India. So if, if one was a Glaswegian, I could just do a really broad Scottish Glaswegian brogue but if it's just one of the other soldiers I don't even really know where to start is there anything you can help me with to to become the characters just for their bits of dialogue in an audio book when I've, I haven't got shoes <laughs> 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 well I would suggest first of all regardless of the character you're playing I think it's really important to think of a person you're telling this story to and tell that person the story and forget about acting just be you telling the story and the 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 character of the person that you're interpreting is not so much the accent they have that's minor right it's what do they mean what do they mean by what they say you can say it in your own voice it doesn't matter as long as the meaning is there and as long as the intention is is there in, in your head. If it's in your head, it'll be in your voice. To act with your voice is 
like the, a major downfall. Okay. Okay. Right. So yeah, it's it's important to understand the character more than it's, it's a yeah to to know what they're about. And, and just than. just when you the chapter one, it was a dark and stormy night, right? <laughs> You're telling somebody that. What are they going through as you tell them? And and you, if you were reading to your wife, you wouldn't do it as if you were reading to a child. You wouldn't say, it was a dark and stormy night. You, you wouldn't go for that, right? Who are you right. reading to? Right. Who is the book intended for? Yeah. And, and help convey it that way. That's my advice. It may not be helpful because I don't know you. <laughs> I have known you now for 15 minutes. <laughs> Yeah. Well, I feel like I know you because you've always been a part of my life because of MASH and because of all the other times you've been on TV. And and I only read your first book, uh, Never Have Your Dog Stuffed, which is a terrific read um, and a great piece of advice too. Uh, never have your dog stuffed. Uh, and yeah. there are some great stories in there. What was the one about the Orient Express? We had a habit in our family when one of our three daughters would graduate college, they could choose anywhere in the world to go on a trip with me because I had, I had been more absent because of MASH than Arlene had in their lives. So we thought it would be a fun thing to do, to let them choose anywhere they wanted to go. And our middle daughter, Elizabeth, wanted to go on the Orient Express to Vienna so we got with our bags at the train station to get on the Orient Express. And we're waiting and waiting and waiting and I don't hear any announcements. And I, I think that it's past the time the train is supposed to leave. When are, where, where are we supposed to go? So I went to the station master and he said, oh, that train left three hours ago. I said, what? We have tickets. What do you mean three? I said, oh, you must have bought them in America. I said, yeah, what difference does that make? It's, it's not like a time difference. So he said, no, the train is gone, but here's what you do. It, the train uh, passes by Lyon. So you have to get on the, the, the blue train, which will get to Lyon before the Orient Express, get off the train, go to the station master and tell them to stop the Orient Express so you can get on. I said, he's not going to stop the train. I said, write that down. Put it on a piece of paper and sign it, the station master of the Paris railroad station. He said, oh, I don't want to. I said, write it down. I'm not going to. All this is in my, my, my half-assed French. So he writes, he reaches for a brown paper bag from his lunch with oil stains still on the bag. And he writes, this man has the authority to stop the train in Lyon. And he signs it. And I said, sign it at Paris Station. I want Paris in there. <laughs> so we get to Lyon. <laughs> get to Lyon in the middle of the night, two in the morning. I knock on the door. And the station master comes out. And he says, yes, what? I said, we, ha we have to stop the train, the Orient Express. He says, I can't stop the Orient Express. I said, yes, you can. He said, no, I can't. I don't have the authority. I said, oh, yeah? Read this. And I show him a paper bag <laughs> with oil stains. <laughs> and he stopped the Orient Express. Wow. And, yep. and, and, and I said, then when we were getting on the train, I was indignant. And I said, I demand to see the director of the train, the, the directeur du train. And the guy said, what? What's that? <laughs> I made up a... <laughs> I made up a title. <laughs> I said, I want to see the head guy here. And they said, he's asleep. And I drew myself up to my full height. And I said, why should he sleep while I walk the streets? <laughs> and it sounds better in French. Yeah. But you you had a way also of dealing with people who you thought were ripping you off by by you know, looking them in the eye. And I don't know whether it was an acting technique, the, the forgive or forget thing. Yeah, I don't know where it came from. Uh, sometimes a producer would cheat me. And I, well, that's when I had no money at all. And I, we were getting by week to week. And, uh, and the producer would make an attempt to cheat me. And I'd level, level my gaze at him. And I'd say, I can forgive or I can forget. Which would you like? 
<laughs> I don't really, I don't really know what it means myself. <laughs> I but love it. I love I it. I said it a number of times, and it really worked. They got very scared. I think scared because they were talking to somebody who didn't make any sense at all. <laughs> they didn't yeah. know what he was capable of. If they think you're crazy, you can get away with a lot more. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, how did you stay so grounded when you became so rich and famous? Because you talked about being, you know, poor or not doing so well, and then all of a sudden you've got all this success. But how did it? How did you stop that changing you? I, I don't. I don't. I hope I'm grounded. I I took myself with me. I for a long time I had never gotten over the fact that my wife and I, as we were bringing up our kids, really had to watch every penny when I drove a cab because I couldn't find acting jobs. I'd come home with $20 or so from a night's work at four in the morning. I'd lay it on the counter and the next morning Arlene had put $2 in an envelope for rent, $2 in an envelope for food, and about five or six envelopes like that. And we, we were literally hand to mouth. And years later, when I was playing starring roles on Broadway, at dinner, if I needed a new pair of pants, I would announce to my family, to my wife and daughters who were around eight, six years old, I'd say, I think I have to buy a new pair of pants. And the little girls would look up at me like, why are you telling me? <laughs> <laughs> what I... I still felt like I, you know, like I had to watch every penny. So I, I, I brought m my feelings of the awareness of uh, kind of plain things in life with me to as much as I could. And you have a thing called face blindness. Is that true? Yeah, it's a condition. It's a brain thing. The, um, uh, now I forget what the part of the brain is, but, but there's a there's a little part of the brain that's devoted to recognizing faces, and some people have a defect in that. Sometimes it's very severe. Mine is midway, but I could have dinner with somebody for three hours, and the day, next day not recognize them on the street. <clears throat> My own daughter, one of our daughters once had changed the color of her hair and once was wearing a cap and both times I didn't know who she was. Wow. So maybe, maybe it's more severe than I, <laughs> than I think. Can, I have to kind I'm always explaining to people that I have it because I know I'm offending some people by not recognizing them. Yeah. Yeah. Can you have a shave with an electric razor without a mirror? <laughs> oh me? You mean I reckon I do recognize my own face. You do? Oh, I see. Right. Okay. <clears throat> right. Yeah, but but uh, um, famous uh, neuroscientist whose name escapes me at the moment had a beard and was primping his beard in the mirror at a restaurant. He thought it was a mirror, but it was glass between him and the booth next door, and he was looking at a guy who also had a beard <laughs> and he didn't know it wasn't his face he really didn't know and wow. that's pretty severe yeah yeah yours isn't at that level but i don't know i don't know um so when you became famous and everything changed is that when you decided you weren't gonna because i heard you don't like to give autographs you'd rather shake someone's hand yeah it, it, it when mash hit it hit so big that it was hard to walk down the street. It was very, it was a difficult experience. And one time I was, I went to see a play on Broadway. And I mean, it was of course a compliment, but it was hard to cope with. There was a line all the way down the aisle to my seat. The people asking, you know, waiting for an autograph. And finally one of the ushers came over and said, do you mind if we start the play now? And I said, for God's sake, start the play. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I mean, you know, so I realized that the only way I could handle that would be to offer to shake hands, which I still do. And I, but now nobody wants an autograph. They want to take a picture. They want a selfie. Do you pose for the selfie? 
if it's a policeman, a person in the armed forces, a waiter or a waitress or a stewardess or steward on a plane. But otherwise, I try to shake hands. Yeah, I, I interviewed John Cleese at his office in Chelsea and, and he won't he will not pose for a selfie and he wouldn't even pose for one with me. He, he would let his <laughs> he would let his assistant take a picture of the two of us, but he wouldn't let me do the selfie because he thought because the lens is too wide and it's too close. He doesn't look good. So, oh, that's interesting. No, I don't have that problem. I don't look good no matter how you photograph me. So, no, you're looking no, pretty I'm good. OK, how old a guy are you now? Alan? Eighty four. Eighty four. Yeah. And uh, recently, well, it was about three years ago, diagnosed with, with, with Parkinson's? Actually, I was diagnosed with Parkinson's five years ago. Oh, okay, right, okay. Yeah, and, and uh, you know, by the time you show symptoms, about 80% of your neurons that produce dopamine have, have been killed, 70 or 80%. So I had it for quite a while before I was diagnosed. But I'm holding off the worst of the symptoms because I'm following a, a, an exercise regimen, I'm taking medications, and I just take it just takes me extra time to get through the day because I have this extra part-time job of coping with that disease. But I I really uh, encourage other people who I meet or who I hear about who've just been diagnosed with this problem, I, I really try to let them know your life is not over. It's not, you don't have to get depressed or frantic or deny you've got it. I now have one friend who I think is denying he has it. And the, if you just face it head on, like a, a reality, a fact, I think reality is our friend. And if you just face it and do something about it, keep moving, work up a sweat, Get do exercises to retain. I box, and it. it uh, I don't actually box. I take boxing lessons. Yeah. Nobody hits me. <laughs> right. I want to yeah. make that clear, and I don't try to hit anybody else. <laughs> <laughs> and what but there were the, things. Go ahead. Sorry. What were the first signs that that something wasn't quite right then that made you go and get checked? I was acting out my dreams, which is a not very well known symptom. And as for example, I was dreaming that someone was attacking me and I threw a sack of potatoes at the person. And in reality, what I was doing was throwing a pillow at my wife. So I had, I read in the paper that that kind of uh, experiences is, can be a symptom in many cases for Parkinson's. So I, I went to a doctor and asked for a, a brain scan and he gave me the usual examination and said, I don't know why you want to scan. You don't have Parkinson's. I said, I think I have it. So I'd really like to know if I have it because I want to do something about it. And he gave me a scan. He called me back and said, oh, you really got it. And what's been the biggest challenge then, dealing with Parkinson's or playing a Republican on the West Wing? <laughs> you know, people, it's so funny. People, so many people have said to me, you know, because I was... I, 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 you know, when I, when I was active politically 30 years ago or more, uh, I was a big champion of the Equal Rights Amendment and worked very hard on that. I, I campaigned for a couple of Democrats for, for president. So people have said to me, was it hard to be a Republican? And I, and I, I, I can't, I just can't understand it. There, it's nobody asked me that. Did, did, nobody ever said, was it hard to play a murderer? <laughs> right. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it, it's, we're, we're all people. If you got, that's the, the whole point of getting up on the stage and putting on plays was to show one another the humanity that we all share. And the podcast is called Clear and Vivid. Right. You you talked about Tom Hanks and Paul McCartney. Do you have a, a favorite episode of all since you've been doing them? No, I don't. The, things come back to me from time to time, though, that are so interesting. Um, a man who was the uh, chief negotiator for hostages 
with the FBI said this fascinating thing. He said the techniques he used to get hostages released were the same techniques you can use to have a happy marriage. <laughs> well, yeah. Does that say something <laughs> more about his marriage, though, than, than anything else? If his marriage no. feels like a hostage situation? No, because the example he gave was very interesting and strange. When he was negotiating, he would never try to get the, the kidnapper to say, you're right. He would, he would talk to him about what the guy believed in, but he didn't want him to say, you're right. He wanted him to say, that's right. So you believe that your people are being disrespected by, by this country. That's right. You believe that you have the right to kidnap somebody. That's right. He gave the other person power by deciding, by declaring something was right. He didn't take away their power by saying, by having the person say, you're right, you dominate me. It's a subtle difference, but that kind of thing, when he had many other techniques, but that kind of thing, if you expand it a little bit, really helps any relationship. You have a right to your opinion. I can only suggest something, and you can tell me if, in your opinion, that's correct, instead of my saying, I'm right, aren't I? Isn't this the fact? Isn't this the fact? Isn't this what you, you, you believe? So why don't you do what I say? It, it's, it turns the process around to where the other per person has a role to play. It's your partner. It's your negotiating partner rather than your object of, uh, of control. So is that your favorite one then, do you think? No, I don't have a favorite. You just I, don't have one. You see, you couldn't no, pick one no. out of the lot. Yeah. Okay. No, uh, there. What the th I can't even remember sometimes what we say because I'm so connected to the person I'm talking to. When I hear it uh, after it's been published and it's on the internet, I think, "Oh my God! Listen to what we said. That was a really interesting conversation. Where did I come <laughs> up with that question? I come up with the question because I'm listening." I don't go in with a list of questions to ask. It's not an ordinary interview. It's a conversation. It, it really is. It just sounds like you've suddenly got to spend some time with the guy in a in a coffee bar or the girl in a coffee bar or something, and you just like and, and away you go. So you really don't prepare at all. You don't have prepared questions at all. I, if it's somebody I don't know, I I prepare by trying to look at other interviews they've given, so I can see what a kind of a person they are, see how they talk, what they like to talk about, what they respond to. And then we get together and it's easier to dance together. And it's a dance, you know, it's playing. Let's play together. Let's play with words together. Let's play with ideas. And it has the arc of a real conversation because I follow them wherever they go. That's why it's so much fun. And that's why I tend to forget what we said because it's happening so much in the moment that I, I, don't rem I don't remember it later. And what podcasts do you listen to? I have so much, I have so little time because of the work I do. I don't listen to many podcasts. I listen to I, I, some science podcasts. In our country, we have a radio show called Science Friday, and I like that a lot. Um, I don't listen to me. What podcast do you listen to? I listen to, I like Mark Maron because it's a long form interview with one of his guests. Yeah, I, uh, I, 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 he interviewed me and I interviewed him. And he does the same thing. He goes for a conversation. Yeah. I never saw him look at a note while we were talking. He probably had a few things in mind he wanted to talk about. But mostly yeah. it, the conversation happened because things evolved. Yeah. And one of the best podcasts I ever heard was Mark Maron interviewing o a Barack Obama. Yeah, in his garage. <laughs> in his garage. Yeah. And I had never heard Obama be so available before, so, so unaware that he was the president. Yeah. He, was, he was a smart, funny person, 
who could play with Mark Maron. Yeah. It's funny, he, I, as I remember, the book you were talking about before, Never Have Your Dog Stuffed. Yeah. It's either that or my second book, I can't remember. Uh, I was nominated for a Grammy for reading the book on audio. And so was Barack Obama for his book. And of course he won. And I listened <laughs> and I knew he would because I listened to his reading. It was fantastic. Talk about playing characters. He could play a variety of people and sound like someone else, but with the attitude, not just the, uh, not just the accent. So are you telling me that a world famous actor and a man who trains people how to act was beaten by an amateur? He's hardly an amateur. <laughs> <laughs> he doesn't have the experience and, and the, uh, the credentials that you do though, does he? He's been on more television shows than I have in my whole life. <laughs> yeah. And I suppose he's played a variety of roles as well, because uh, being the president, you have to, who was it said to be the president? You have to be a cold blooded killer. You have to be able to order the attack on the, the garrison and then go to the cocktail party. Yeah. Right. And then go to the survivors when, uh, yeah. after, after you take off your tux. Yeah. I never have understood because so much of that is true. I've never understood why so many people want to be president. Yeah. Yeah, it's a shame the current person wants to be president, but still. <laughs> I don't talk politics. No, anymore. let's not do that. Let's not do that. What's on your bucket list? I don't think I have one. You don't? I mean, you've only got, what, another 30 years to work that out? Well, my whole life has been an improvisation, and whatever's come my way, I've made the best I could of it. So I don't know what the point of a bucket list is. The bucket list is more, more good surprises. So what's do you have next? A bucket, do, you have, do you have a bucket list? No, um, I suppose there's places I'd like to see. I'd like to see things like the Taj Mahal and the pyramids and things that you know I haven't seen. But I don't know why. I don't think my life will be any more fulfilled if I do that. I just, right, I just... you'll get there and you'll say, "Wow, that looks just like the postcard." <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Alan Alder, it's been terrific talking to you. Uh, I've enjoyed it. Thank you very much. Best of luck with the podcast. The podcast is called uh, Clear and Vivid. You can hear Alan at 11 o'clock uh, every weekday on podcast radio. And also it's available where all good podcasts are, particularly see if you can find the one with Tom Hanks. It's, it, it's an absolute beauty. <laughs> it's great. And it has been a real thrill. Uh, talking to you like I say it feels like you've been you've been with me my whole life and uh, it is uh, it's just magnificent to be able to actually well, you talk. know we've only been talking for a half hour but it feels like my whole life too <laughs> I don't know if that's a good thing or a bad thing then. <laughs> I, should, I know you well enough now to kid you Alan Alder thank you very much good to meet you bye-bye